well, I think we'll get started since you're all here on time. I want to keep you waiting. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Kelsey O'Neill. I work at the EPA um, doing community involvement. Sorry that. It's a good start. Yeah. Um, so you all should have agendas around the table. There's just one minor change, um, which is why I posted it up here. One of our project managers couldn't make it this evening, so we just moved the contract status update to the first item um, down the agenda. So it's just a little off of what you have in your hand there. I am holding a mic because we have um, cable access here, Bedford and Fairhaven. I just ask if anybody has questions, please make sure you have a mic in your hand so the cable can pick it up because they'll be hearing this as well. There's also sign sheets floating around the room. If you don't mind, sign your um, name on there. It would be great if you want to put your email address on. I don't send out a whole lot, but when we have meetings or updates on the site, we'd like to send notifications out to folks. So if you get your email on there, that would be wonderful. Um, we'll go through each of the presentations. If you've got you know, clarifying questions throughout, feel free to just give me a nod and I'll bring the mic over to you. But otherwise, we're going to try and get through the material. And if we could wait till the end of a few of the slides, at least for the presenters to get through and take some questions after that. So that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ellen Aorio, who is um, with the Army Corps of Engineers, and she's gonna give you an update on our contract. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm the project manager of the Corps of Engineers uh, for the New Bedford Barber Superfund site. Um, so, the update is that after much ado, we have finally awarded the remedial action contract for New Bedford. It's a $350 million contract. It's a three-year base contract with options for an additional seven years, giving us an option to do work under that contract for 10 years. So it was actually a reinstatement of an original contract that was awarded uh, in 2004, in December of 2004. Uh, we had a protest on it. 14. And, uh, uh, yes. I did that yesterday. Yes, 2014. Uh, November of 2014. So, um, so we're all set. We're ready to go. We have Jacobs Engineering uh, on, on under contract now to continue the work. And does anybody have any questions on that? Sure, Karen. No, I always got some questions. Um, this is for the re sorry. Thanks. Is this contract for the remainder of the cleanup we have to harbor, or does it also include the federal channel dredging by the Army Corps of Engineers that's yet to come? Up? Okay, that's an excellent point. Con uh, that's an excellent question. It is simply for the New Bedford Harbor cleanup site. Any other questions on that contract? Okay. Thank you. So uh, Dave Leonard is going to present uh, the next couple of agenda items and fill in for uh, Elizabeth Stanley, who could not be here tonight. Okay. Well, uh, I'm filling in for Elaine and a bit for Jenny, so uh, I will do my best to fill in for all of my name is Dave Lutterer. Uh, I am one of the project managers for EPA for this Bedford Harbor Superfund project. Uh, first thing, I guess, before I start talking, the, the significance of what Ellen is saying, I'll to talk about a little bit. Uh, now that we have our contracting in place, and we have our settlement funding in place, and our record of decision in place, we now have all the elements we need for this project to really get going in a serious way. So we will not be constrained by any of those factors. So. We would start seeing things happen at an increasing pace of scale that is much larger in some cases than we're, we're used to. But things are really going to start moving, and this cleanup is really going to pick up steam. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit our, about what's been going on in Lower Harbor. The bulk of the dredging that has gone on during 2016, which we recommend, involves our CAD cell project. Uh, as People who are long time watchers of our project now, we've already completed the first three steps in creating the cell. We're now in step four where we're going around the, harbor, the lower harbor predominantly, uh, dredging up contaminated sediment over our cleanup level in the lower harbor, which is 50 parts per million, and uh, depositing the material after dewatering in the, in the CAD cell where it settles to the bottom. Um, just to give some perspective, 
this is a slide showing the state enhanced revenue drain. This judging that you see on the screen was all done by the state under authority that was given to them under our record of decision at state expense under state direction. And this work was done between 2004 and 2014. And it had the benefit of deepening uh, the channel so that the South Carolina, the uh, Congress terminal could be open near the hurricane barrier. But it also had, uh, at the same time, there were significant um, decreases in the sediment concentrations in that part of the harbor, which is on the next slide. So you'll see through the period, uh, those, that cat, those cat cells were installed between 2004 and 2008. Actually, actually, 2004 and 2012, and filled between 2005 and 2013, I think. In 2000, so in 2004, when they started the project, you can see the distribution of uh, PCB and sediment. Only 18 NOAA congeners, just so everyone understands. I can explain that after the meeting if anyone's interested in understanding that better. And this is only a measure of the PCBs in the top two centimeters of the, uh, of the, uh, of the sediment. Okay, next slide. So four or five years later, EPA came back in 2009, and the average was just about the same, 4.8 parts per million. The cat zone projects had gotten going. But if you show the last slide, this is from 2014. We dropped from 4.8 down to only 2.8. And 21 of our 29 stations in that part of the harbor were better and lower than 2000 in the previous uh, set of data. So we see a lot of improvement in the chemistry and the sediment in that top layer of the harbor, it got a lot better. In addition to that, if I don't have the data on, on, on figures, in addition to that, the um, our measurements of what kind of organisms in the benthic community, the kind of, um, of um, uh, aquatic organisms that live in that <coughs> top layer of sediment, the numbers of, uh, of species we found went up a lot, and the uh, the numbers of individuals went up a lot. We're seeing the benthic community come back to life in that part of the harbor. So again, while you cannot say the cat cells caused that improvement, they did happen at the same time. So well, the jury is out on that. So we'll, we'll continue to do this kind of monitoring. The next round, of course, would be in 2019. Could we get the next? So just to give you an idea of what, what we've been doing, you can see we have very, very limited funding. Starting in 2004, we started a dredging pro uh, program in the Upper Harbor. And we were able to work with a very limited amount of uh, funding, except for this year. This is the year of the federal stimulus project. We got a little extra funding. What was that? Thir uh, 30 35 million. 35 million. Thank you. So we got additional funding that year. So we did about $250,000 between in those 10 years. But since the settlement has come into effect, you can see the, the change in the amount of material we were able to remove from the harbor. Particularly this year, we're going to remove, and this is only, this is projected out uh, kind of uh, like that, but it's going to be around 82,000 cubic yards. It's going to be close to, but not beating our record from 2014. Uh, next year, we're anticipating beating our old record easily and being around 140,000 yards. So you're going to see, again, things will really pick up if we can stay on this schedule. Like, we can't promise this, but uh, it's, that's probably around the range we're going to be in in the upper harbor, in the lower harbor next year. Just to be clear, from here, 04 to 15, this is all upper harbor. These last two bars are from the lower harbor. Okay, next slide. So going back again to where we were when we started EPA dredging at the beginning of this year in January, uh, we had just built these two cat cells. You see this cat cell here, that's the low harbor cat cell in the So in January, we began dredging. The first place we began dredging was off Carbon Point, just the south of Carbon Point. By the, uh, and you'll be able to see when the slide changes the uh, the effect of just, this is the effect of the state dredging, and now when Kelsey gets the slide, you'll see the addition of all the EPA dredging that's about to occur. The yellow dredging, you see in bright, the brighter yellow, the luster color, um, is 
done or will be done by the end of the 16th. So the yellow you see here, uh, all right, Harvey Point, this is all done. And we have our confirmation data back. This is the area we have our confirmation data back, which all passed our criteria. And up here, you can see we've been working steadily all summer long along the working waterfront. We've had a lot of cooperation from uh, the businesses that work over there. Um, this has the side benefit of deepening the water in front of their, in front of their dockage, which is an additional benefit. All that material has been taken to the cat cell and dropped in. Next year, probably starting the first quarter of next year, there'll be a new, um, yet another contract issued by the Corps of Engineers in these bluish purple areas. And that, although it doesn't look like it's a significant amount more, the yellow areas we did this year constitute about 24 acres, uh, constituting about 80,000 yards of material. The blue area is about 39 acres in area. It constitutes about 100 and 20 to 140,000 cubic yards. So we'll be have over 200,000 yards of material in the CAD zone around 15 months from now, 12 to 15 months from now, depending on how our contracting goes on this blue, bluish area. So you're going to start seeing big changes down there. That's the thing. So we're projecting about 82,000 yards for this year. We've got probably you know four weeks left. Four to, four to six weeks in the lower harbor. Then we're gonna move the dredge up to the upper harbor, north of the bridges, uh, north of uh, the Cockshell Street Bridge, and we're going to say around 30,000 cubic yards are gonna be taken from up there, put on small scouts, taken under the bridges, and taken down to the cat cell for disposal. Then when we get into next year, uh, we're gonna be doing this additional yard is between 137,000 and 169,000, depending on how much extra overdredge we take, which is a complicated topic. Um, <clears throat> that work will all be done next year. That's that bluish area you saw on the map. And then, uh, after that material is in the cell, we'll finish our dredging in the upper harbor, allow the material to consolidate, and once we believe it's consolidated properly and it's, it's full of its capacity, we'll bring our capping material in. The timing of all that is much more complicated. It depends how fast the material settles and consolidates in the cell and um, how we're generating material um, elsewhere. So that's why we haven't asked the subject to change. All this is uh, the first three. Uh, bullets are pretty much fit, uh, fairly fixed. The last one is, is harder to really project, but within a couple of years, uh, we should be in a position where we know uh, when we'll be capping the cell. Okay, so just a little, few pictures of what we've been doing this year. This is an excellent photo that was taken by Kelsey herself. herself. We went out of the bars. This is the very, very first on engine. This is the first bucket of material that came out of the harbor. February 1st, uh, for the lower harbor cat cell. So this is the first bucket of contaminated material we taken out of the harbor. It was like right after lunch. And we went out and uh, made sure we were there when the first bucket came out. So this material, uh, the back, this material is picked up by the bucket, and then the bucket goes up and swings out over the barge, which is six compartments, and it loads the material into the barge. And if you go to the next slide, you can see it's all yeah, I'm having trouble seeing that. Is that what you said? I think it's the left. So, as you can see, there, this is called the There are six compartments in the pocket scale. Uh, so, the material has been uh, usually the second and the fourth compartments. Um, and the material is uh, then taken over to a dewatering facility we have in the CAD. Bar, uh, the scouts pushed over to a dewatering facility. Uh, the water is pumped out, and then once the material, the water has been pumped out, free standing water is taken over to the wherever in the CAD we are trying to place the material. We try to paste it evenly, um, and uh, it's dropped into the, into the CAD. You can see our 400 horsepower tugboat pushing it over there. 
And that, that's really all announced here. There are pictures on the bottom that show uh, another thing we've been busy doing this summer, which shouldn't really be overlooked, but oftentimes it is, which is we got a lot of debris we needed to pick up out of the harbor and move out of our way. We cannot dredge if there are massive pieces of metal. Uh, we found a lot of debris uh, behind five kylers. There was a lot of material, which I believe the, uh, the legend is is from the hurricane of 1938. That, that fell in at, at some point during one of the catastrophic hurricanes before the hurricane Paris. But, so we had to haul that material up to Soria Street and, and uh, dispose of it. Okay, next slide. Air monitoring, I know it's a big concern for everyone. We uh, monitor the air all, all, all year long. And again, we, as it's been the case before, we had no issues with uh, meeting the 110 nanogram per cubic meter standard that we have for the harbor. Um, yeah, all the levels well below that, just as we had modeled. Before we did the work, we monitored during the work, and the levels were pretty much in, in line with what we had predicted. We also did uh, <coughs> turbidity monitoring up and down uh, part of the uh, area we were dredging. For instance, we were dredging in this area, which I think is 36 G. This is bad when I can tell the shape from the shape on. <laughs> I see these shapes in my head when I shut my eyes to go to bed at night, I see the shapes. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, what we were dredging in here, barges in here, we would monitor 300 feet up and down uh, current of the, of the vessel with a boat that went up and down in a, in a transect. And what we saw basically was that we were in compliance with our turbidity, uh, that is the amount of cloudiness in the water that we were looking um, could so you repeat? No, we, we could you repeat that last part you just said? I couldn't hear you. I'm oh, sorry. sure, sure. We had a we had a vessel uh, patrolling 300 feet up and down gradient where we were working, and we were trying to measure how much turbidity was in the water. <laughs> uh, we used 50 parts, 50 net, what we call 50 NTUs. Is, that's the unit that, that turbidity is measured in, and we did have any issues with meeting meeting that compliance. So. There was no uh, issue with us um, transporting or spreading the material outside the area we were working. We also had an up current reference area, so the, the, what we were measuring was how much turbidity there was above what the background was for the harbor anyway. The harbor is quite turbid, especially after it rains. Anyway, okay. Similarly, we did uh, turbidity monitoring around the CAD cell. Whenever we were dropping material into the cell, we would have the boat patrolling around the edges of our boat curtain and also up and down the current of the, of the CAD to make sure there was no material escaping. And again, we had no issue with that. So that's a, basically a, a summary of, uh, I, you might want to read them off because there's more pictures so that's the subtitle work that we did in the lower harbor this year. There was no dredging going on in the upper harbor this year. Um, so we also focused on intertidal work. Can, I, can we take a pause and see? Does anybody have questions on those set of slides? Sure. Dave, if you could please go back to the map that shows the yellow areas and also the blue areas okay. for you as on the Corps of Engineers on the New Bedford side. That there you go. Yes, thanks. And Ellen, you might want to chime in on this one too. Paul Crafty with the DEP had notified us at Kansas Cross the River Coalition that the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is in the process of planning their own CAD cell in the lower harbor to store permanently, of course, uh, one million cubic yards of contaminated sediment. Looking at that map, we were trying to figure out just where they plan on putting a cat cell to store one million cubic yards of PCB sediments, given the fact that the EPA cat cell is holding 300,000 cubic yards. So where would it be? Yeah, so just, I don't know if, we're not really in a place to answer that question because it's not EPA, an EPA project. I don't know if Paul has an answer right now or if we want to follow up. Yeah. Uh, 
designated poor area, uh, I should say this is the DMP, which is the debris disposal process that the Coastal Zone Management went through, designated an area six to 195 for the disposal of any navigation material. But if you look at that map, uh, Mr. Crafty, you'll see that already the area near the Fairhaven shoreline where the Cozy Cove Marina is is just a little bit north of the Essex Bridge that has already been dredged and placed in the EPA CAD cell. If you go further up, there is some space between Oxford Village and also Marsh Island, areas of Fairhaven. And again, Oxford Village is a densely populated residential area. So where do you feel that the Army Corps of Engineers is going to find a spot to put in one million cubic yards of PCB sediments? Well, it's not really up to me. They need to decide where to do it. I would point out, though, the four CAD cells, the borrow pit and CAD cell one, two, and three, contain uh, roughly 500,000 cubic yards. It's like 550. Yeah, 550. <coughs> so that's roughly the size. Those aren't really large CAD cells in terms of depth. You can build it, if you build a bigger one, you don't need as much area, because you can build down. So that's the one, one thing. The two on the, the, the bottom two are in 30 feet of water. So they were uh, uh, different, more difficult to build in terms of size because you had limited space there because you could only go so far down because of bedrock issues. So given that that and the other two probably fit uh, 250 to 300,000, building a larger one at one point in time, you don't need as much space as those, those ones that exist now. So my guess is they'll be built to close proximity to the existing ones because in order to build one, you need a certain amount of depth and it also depends on the size or the depth of the contamination layer you need to pull up because you need to provide for that for disposal. So you know, it's good. it can go up there. It doesn't mean the court itself can't decide to go through another process and decide to put it in place else, but that would add to their budgeted amount because then they have to go through a separate process to decide to take it someplace else. So the, the state has decided that that's the appropriate place to put it. So I think we can, we can follow up on this too. Right. I don't want to get they, too... They haven't decided yet. Right. They're still in the planning stages. My understanding the cities, uh, Harvard Development Commission and uh, Fairhaven, um, I don't know if they're jointly doing it, but at least the Harvard Development Commission is looking to work with the Corps of Engineers to build a large enough facility for not only that dredging, but the additional dredging needs for both Fairhaven and Bedford. This, uh, the, the number of phases has been four. And I would point out the first phase, which is that little blue, that blue amount in where the state pier is, was not done at the state hand uh, But other than that, the rest of the navigation ones have been. And it's been planned to do the rest of them under the same process. But, um, there's, there's certainly enough space to put a million cubic yards of material without butting up again like Fairhaven because they would most likely built, be built next to the existing ones, similar to the ones that are now there, they're already been built. Alan, you're with the Army Corps of Engineers. Do you have any information to provide us? I'm not anymore. Right. And I would say, I would just speculate, and that's really up to them to decide to design. Yeah, I mean, Paul is, is is correct that it's still under our planning process so there really has been no um, precise locations identified at this time and, and so we know we'll follow up on that eventually perhaps another meeting or through the state hands remedy process maybe we'll be having some meetings on it but one more yeah i've been contacted by the power development commission actually today and they'd like to set up another the state and so we'll email everybody who's uh, been on email this, so you'll, you'll know when that's going to happen. So. Right, Thank you. Right. Does anybody else have questions about the presentation from Dave there, Catsell, or I so did, far? Actually, I thought of one thing that I should probably add, which is this yellow area here, south of Harvey Point, 
as the area we've got our data back and validated from after we finished dredging the average level we found in that shape which is about 14 acres and was uh, about 14 parts per million so it's well below 50. People can't hear me. Just I just had to repeat the last statement that you made as well below the. Ah, about that. I'm oh, sure. 14 parts per million. 14 parts per million. Our, our criteria is down below harbor for each area is an average of 50, and the average there was 14. So, um, so this is work that was done. Uh, this is work that was done uh, under uh, the auspices of uh, Elaine Stanley, my colleague, uh, who couldn't make it tonight. She had a family emergency. So I'm pinch hitting for her. Uh, the cleanups of, this is, involves a cleanup of some shoreline property, intertidal property right across from the uh, Market Basket supermarket uh, between Coxwell Street and Sawyer Street. Um, we decided that we would try to do this part of the intertidal cleanup first uh, in preparation to, uh, as a preparatory st step towards allowing the city to pursue their riverwalk um, project on that as a, as a starter, starting point. So the cleanup started in January and was done in April. Uh, the restoration was done in June, it looked real good. We excavated a total of 4,872 cubic yards uh, which was more than we had anticipated. There used to, if people are familiar with the area, there used to be an old derelict uh, pier there like this, uh, that it looked like it had burned down. And we found a lot of additional material underneath that, but uh, we, we, did, we did remove it. And uh, backfilled the area and replanted salt marsh grass and low, uh, for the, we replanted salt marsh grass and restored the low marsh pond. So this is a few photos we have. Here's what it looked like when we got there. This is that area I was telling you about. It's a problematic area. What we call, we end up calling the crib. I've heard people calling it, which was this old derelict pier. I, the theory is, is that that was where the mill, the, uh, the mill that was there was there uh, received their oil shipments. Um, but anyway, we we found some of their oil. Uh, <laughs> we found quite a bit of it. So. After the material was removed, it went that the material went down 14 feet in that in that one little area, wow. that one tiny area. Um, we backfilled, we rebuilt the shoreline, uh, protected from erosion from the tides, and then um, rebuilt the mud flats and planted the salt marsh and of course the the upland grass, which was hydroceded. And this is the plan view of what it looks, what, it, what was planted there, what it looks like today. So it extends basically from that CSO near uh, the 7-Eleven supermarket, uh, 7-Eleven gas station, all the way up to our facility on Sawyer Street. So the material was removed from this area and taken by truck into our Sawyer Street facility, dewatered and shipped to the landfill in Michigan. Again, about 5,000 cubic yards. Intertidal sampling status, just a quick, whoop. Just a quick note, uh, we have uh, completed our, finally, we have completed uh, all of our intertidal sampling around the uh, harbor. Uh, we have notified the homeowners of the results and are gonna notify them of the additional re uh, results that we've gotten since their first notification soon. And we should have all of the uh, correspondence out to the to the landowners by the end of the uh, by the end of the year, roughly, at which point we'll then work on getting a report together to issue to the public. But um, first, we need to notify all the landowners involved. So that's where we're at on intertidal sampling. Do you want to just say why that was? Too? Does everybody know was where that was? Where it was was uh, it was basically uh, uh, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to say Pierce Hill Cove. It was from Riverside Park north to uh, Wood Street, and then back down the Christian side, Fairhaven, all the way down on that side, all the way down to Route 6, where we can get access. Uh, I got a question. Sure. Since you had, since you have been through the river walk and everything, Edward Vera, 
since you're gonna do the, the planning for the river walk on the eastern shoreline, all the sampling that you've done, has any of that sampling been above so they can start uh, restoration or digging it out? Uh, replacing the river walk is all, uh, first of all, the river walk is an adventure. No, no, the last portion of what you said, the east side of the river. Okay, the east side. All the testing you did, as it, as it exceed the amount, so where you have to uh, replace the shoreline in any kind of way, put the eel grass or whatever dirt replacement. Well, we, we try to leave the areas where. Because you said so you're going you yeah. to inform the homeowners, right, of the results. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to know. All the landowners on that. On yeah, the but if it exceeds the recommendation, that, that doesn't mean restoration, but the ones that do it see uh, is, uh, is the cleanup money going to use to restore the restore the if we disturb it yeah sure we would restore it. well is it no, I'm saying if it's above the, rep, the, the amount we wouldn't touch it if it wasn't above the cleanup okay. yeah. so yeah. yeah. you're talking about elevation or yeah I think I, I think I can sorry so you, you understand asking, what I'm saying yeah so we have a, most of the sampling back most of it is well under our action level which in that area is uh, most 25 parts per million because we consider it recreational in that intertidal spot. Most of it is well below that, I can tell you that, without having shared all the data yet. If we do have to do work, which probably will take place on a few properties, then yes, the settlement money will be used as part of that remediation where we'll go it's in. It's not going to be to the homeowners' expense. Not at all. No. No. And any remediation and, and on those sites, just to be clear, if we do have to do that, we'll work really closely. Similar to what we did on Parker Street, which some of you know, we'll, we'll be with the homeowners, we'll speak with them about the process, make sure they're comfortable with, our, you know, with what we're going to be doing, if they have things important to them on their property. But we don't anticipate that um, actually happening because the results have been really positive. One, so one last question. Um, you have the low, the low tide, the high tide. Are you going to do up the flood zone? If the sampling taken at the mark of the high tide shows reason for us to go further up onto someone's property, then yes, we will. Kelsey, she um, so for residential properties, though, yeah. the oh, cleanup okay. level is is one, not twenty five. So I just want to make yeah. that clear. Yes, yeah, thank you. So, good job. So to clarify, if if no, uh, I know, I know, I knew. I I, yeah, I know you knew that. So if we find something on the mean high tide mark, for instance, that's yeah. above one or close to something of concern, then then we'll look further into it. Yeah, it's all it's all going to be done on a, a property by property basis, and that and we're still early on in the process but we just wanted to find out what the universe of what we might be dealing with is that is the point of the Dave you made reference to the intertidal area near Austin Village Bay Haven shoreline as being an average of 14 pots per million now that average was taken That's some from time, some how time. many how many sample areas and what was the highest level that you had I that you see. ended up getting a, a lower average that was not yeah, you're not talking about any title now. You're talking. You're going back to the subtitle. Okay. Stop. Hold on. I can tell you the answer. I can tell you the answer. The answer is. The answer is in that area. Um, the there were 24 samples taken, and there were, uh, 11 of them were less than 10. And um, one of them was over. Let's see here. Looks like the highest one is 35. Where was that near? I, I, I couldn't. I don't have the map here, but it's again, it's a sub one subtitle sample. I didn't hear the last the last figure you said. So I'm sorry. 35. Thank you. 35. The average was 14.2. Uh, for the 24 samples. 10, yeah. And, uh... So the subtitle area, could you give us a, uh, uh, from what area to what area? We're talking from uh, Route 6 to Mosh Island? Just uh, what is that both? area? Where did you take the 24 oh, samples from? I happen, happen to have this poster board here, so I can show you. So it's on your slide, too. Yeah, but I have to yeah, sure. So this, uh, this, those samples were all taken in these yellow areas, which are spot. I, I don't know the information. But. So 
So you can't tell us where the 35 parts per million no, was. No, again, it, it, all, all the, every one of those samples meets at uh, 850. Uh, we're using as the average in each of those areas. Yes. And and we could get back to our location. We know where it is. We know where it is. We know where well, it is. I saw the well, I, I'm just questioning that, too, because you know we, we've had some science students from Fairhaven High School right. go wading into the water near the uh, Route 6 bridge. Right. And I'm just concerned that if they're walking in through 35 pots per million of PCBs, again, well, it would be nice to know. Well, we've been working with the high school. We've done monitoring at that location that you're speaking of, and their levels are nowhere near that. The levels, I, I don't have those numbers and here. They, they should not be wading into the subtype area, too. Well, but, yeah. but if you want, we can get those data points on a map. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I just point out that the cleanup number is 50, so they could you be might say, okay. Just point out the cleanup number, north of Route 6, is 50. So if everything was 49, they wouldn't be doing any cleanup. So the 35 is not an it's extraordinary it's high number. Yeah, the average. Probably, the what is the average up there anyways? The, the average out. The average out in that those that, that general area is 14.2. That's what our sampling show. Okay, no, but so the area is not nice rich. What's the what's the other the background? What the what the LTM data, the yeah. data from 2014 shows is that the back background widely dispersed in the top layer is about eight. So we're now getting to the point where it's, the areas we're dredging are about the level that the area uh, that the background level is for Lower Harbor anyway. So, so that's what's been going on. And then very briefly, now that our contract is in place, uh, as Ellen points out before, we're going to be looking at coming up with a comprehensive plan to uh, attack the issue and the prop, the uh, cleanup strategy we're going to use in the upper harbor going forward. And that's going to be going on the next over the next uh, probably uh, three to six months, where we're going to try to figure out exactly how we're going to sequence the work uh, what kind of equipment we're going to use, and, uh, and again, uh, what equipment we'll use in various situations. Uh, what equipment, we'll, for instance, we'll use when there's three feet of water, what equipment we'll use when there's six feet of water, uh, what kind of equipment we'll use in intertidal areas, how, how we're going to access uh, areas. Um, all, a lot of intricacy has to be worked out, and we'll be working on that. That's a lot of work that'll be going on between now and the next time we do a meeting like this in the I have one last question before you move up to the next subject. Since our last meeting, since our last meeting north of the Cockroft Street Bridge, right. you're going to do mechanical dredging. You have a boundary line where you're going to do the mechanical dredging <coughs> south of Cockroft Street Bridge. Has that been extended northward since our last meeting? No. Since Not last meeting, no. Okay. Now, again, what I want to point out is like, the cat cell has capacity, certain capacity, we won't know its real capacity is until we fill it. So those lines are not hard and fast going forward, but for, we don't have any plans right now to go, to go down there. No. Okay, I think that was it for that. So we're ahead of schedule. So if anybody has any other questions, otherwise we'll, we'll keep going forward. Considering the weather that we've had, has the weather in any way affected the CAD cells, the walls of the CAD cell, maybe a wall caving in or anything like that, um, even moving any of the contaminated The we, we monitor the CAD cell, we look at the we do the thermometry, you know, where what the thermometry is, we use sonar to see what the stability of the slopes are and how the material is setting up on the bottom. So we're actually watching that very top to be sure that that's not an issue. We haven't seen any issues now.
Great to be back and see some familiar faces in the crowd. It's been uh, five years or so, or so since I uh, worked on the site, and uh, happy to be back. we got a great harbor here, and it's uh, a pleasure to be working on it again. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the next piece of uh, the intertidal cleanup, <clears throat> shown here. Um, this is CPA Sawyer Street facility, the new market basket area is right over here, gently. Uh, the parcel that Dave Letterer was just talking about, uh, the shoreline cleanup is right over here, off the map. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to, over the winter, uh, extend the cleanup of the intertidal area, uh, shown here in these colors. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but we're, we tried to show the low tide and the high tide lines, and we're generally working within that intertidal <coughs> area. And uh, it, it, it works out nice in that we uh, can mobilize all the equipment, the contractor that is, can mobilize all their equipment from the EPA Sawyer Street facility. I don't have to go and, and uh, you know, track over the Riverside Park or anything like that. Um, if anyone has been out there, you, you'll see that some clearing has started, uh, but not any excavation work yet. What we wanted to do is do the clearing uh, start building the service road and really get uh, surveyors really good access uh, in that area that had been heavily overgrown. <clears throat> um, one of the challenges for this uh, cleanup and restoration is the fact that there's a lot of invasive species nearby um, and we want to make sure that we do everything we can to minimize those nearby invasive species from invading, if you will, our, uh, our newly restored salt marsh. So in other words, um, we'll go in, we'll remove all the areas that are, you see in color here, down to cleanup levels, confirm that their cleanup levels have been achieved, uh, put in all that material that's removed and go to an off-site landfill for disposal. Um, <clears throat> The contract will place clean backfill and uh, plant salt marsh uh, to replace the salt marsh that we, we dug up. It's kind of a fringing salt marsh along the, the shoreline. Um, and we don't want those invasive species to um, ruin all that, uh, our investment in the, the new salt marsh. So um, that's why it's clearing now to make sure that <coughs> surveyors can get in there and uh, really uh, a lot of micro topography and different patches of invasive species and uh, we'll have a very, very fine-tuned understanding of, of what we're up against. So uh, that's what's going on now. Um, we hope to be all done by the springtime. Uh, we'll have a firmer schedule as we uh, get the results from the survey. Uh, I just, just wanted to let you know that uh, work has started. Um, and I guess on a broader scale, you'll be seeing a lot more of this, as Dave mentioned, now that we, and Ellen, now that we have the contract in place, the settlement funds in place, um, the scale of the cleanup is going to, it's, the pace of the cleanup is really going to accelerate. And we'll have to do this intertidal work uh, on both sides of the upper harbor, where it's above cleanup levels, on, on the settlement's time, not the not the homeowner's time, uh, absolutely. Um, so, um, you know, we're working closely with the city, uh, make sure that our work doesn't interfere and hopefully complements the river walk concept that is, is uh, uh, <clears throat> underway. Uh, I've been out of the loop for five years, so I don't ask too many questions on that, but, um, uh, you know, I think there's, there's some uh, opportunity to, uh, save both projects and plots, hopefully, and if they're coordinated closely. Um, I think that's about it. We'll be doing air monitoring, obviously, to make sure that uh, there's no problems there. Um, and so we look forward to reporting out next time we meet. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Uh, where are there going to be the access roads to get this material off? Uh, that's uh, approximately this gray road right here. 
Uh, so you guys are going to put it. I stress the word approximate because we're uh, we're trying to avoid the need for an access road up here. We kind of run out of real estate. Okay, so the road or the, the path? Uh, we hopefully will not. You talk about the existing walking paths. Yeah, the, park. the walking path to the park. Yeah, uh, we hope not to impact them. Uh, if we do, obviously we'll have to replace them. But um, trying to avoid it. We can't guarantee that we won't need a little bit of access here and there, but we're trying hard to avoid it. Yeah, because a lot of that invasive species is right on the path. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, we were just out there today, actually looking at that. Uh, so you're gonna start on the southern end or the northern end? Yeah, we'll start down here. We'll yep. start down there. Yep. Okay. Um, are there going to be special signage put up besides the ones that are already there? Yeah, we've been talking about that. Um, and, you're, and you're going to pull the fence back a little bit into the park so that people won't get into it? Pretty much where the, yeah, we'll be putting beefier temporary fencing up. No, no, I mean, now you're going to, the, the existing fence where it sits now, are you going to pull it back into the park so you can have the room to do your work? Y yes. Uh, so there, there, by there, there, when was the last by time I've been there? But there's, 30 there's already feet, 40 feet. There's already some orange temporary plastic fencing in place. Um, and one before we get in there and start doing the heavy duty excavation, there'll be a, a, a beefier chain link fence in the same location as the uh, the plastic orange fence. So if you get a chance to go out there, uh, you, can, you can see what I mean. Is, uh, there's a lot of fencing, so hopefully we're talking about the same, same no, area. You know what I'm talking about, yeah. the existing fence, but you're going to push it back 30 feet, 40 feet, whatever, so you can have your trucks yes. and go up and down. Yes. We'll and there's going to be new signage that this is contaminated work that's being done. Yeah, yeah, well, we need to make sure it's multilingual. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Okay. Um,
and I'm since trying to do a couple of different things to reach out to folks about the recommendations around seafood consumption in the harbor. For anybody who doesn't know, that's the main reason that we're here and why we're cleaning up the harbor is to address the concerns of seafood consumption, as well as dermal contact, of course, but um, seafood con consumption is the main driver. So as part of the plan, we did a lot of outreach and spoke to a lot of folks in the community about where people are fishing, if they're familiar with the project, and feedback on things like Eddie was just talking about, signage that people are actually going to pay attention to and not just walk right by or throw their line in next to a sign that says no fishing. So this is one of the newer signs that we came up with, which is just a lot more straightforward than some of the verbal signs that we had, which were all um, words and no pictograms like this. We're working on updating new signs that are in the process of hopefully working with the city of New Bedford and Fairhaven on. Um, we want to make sure that in areas where people are welcome to shellfish, for instance, that they are, um, you know, not tur not turned away by a sign like this. And we want to make sure that they're not. In the, these are in the right areas, and we recognize there are areas in some places further out of the hurricane barrier, for instance, where people can shellfish. And so we're working on a lot of these issues and trying to make sure that our communication is as clear as possible with the people in the communities. So as part of that, um, sorry. We put together a new fact sheet. This is not meant for you to read, I'm sorry, I know it's small writing. Um, we do have a few copies here if anybody wants to take them back with them, but we put this double-sided form together and translated it into Spanish, Portuguese, and Vietnamese. We did get a lot of feedback that Quiche is a commonly spoken language in New Bedford, but after speaking to a number of people who speak Quiche in their homes and community, um, I learned to play that it's not really much of a written language, so we didn't end up with that translation. Um, so what we did with this is we worked with the city of New Bedford and the Center or Community Economic Deve Development Center, which is down on Cushion Avenue. Um, they work a lot with the local residents here, trying to help them with everything from tax forms to getting licenses to English as a second language classes and getting jobs. Um, and we had a, an idea that we've gotten started, which is to hire a few local people in the community to go out and assist with our outreach. The idea behind that is that they, first of all, have, you know, they live in the community, they know the locations much better than, than I certainly do. They speak the language and um, are more approachable. Um, I've done my fair share of trying to walk up and speak to people fishing, and I don't want to say it's not well received, but I'm, you know. <laughs> I'm not maybe the person that they want to stop and speak with and listen to. And so um, this was our effort to try and hire a few local people. We did put the money on a cooperative agreement with the city of New Bedford, thanks to Michelle. And um, we just finished up our second year of this program and are hoping to continue it moving forward. The idea is that the folks who we've called outreach coordinators take this one pager out with them, along with two other documents. Um, this is one of them. I'm sorry, this is not. Well, you could. I pulled out, highlighted the language in there. They go out with a checklist and a questionnaire. Um, the checklist is for them to answer just these questions, so they can take note of the location around them. How many people are there? What um, are they fishing? How many people do you speak with? What language are they speaking? If you can tell, sometimes they'll take notes to let us know. You know. I ran into an Asian family who said they came down from Boston, for instance. And so we take this feedback, um, and I've entered it all and got some of the results from last summer. I haven't collected everything from this year. They worked 2015 from about mid-July to the end of October. This year we started a little bit earlier, I think the end of May, and they just wrapped up um, a week or two ago. So that's the checklist they have, and then Again, I apologize for the small writing here, but I um, also took a questionnaire. So I did ask them, um, and sorry to back up a little bit, at the beginning of the season, we did an orientation with them, myself and two of our other project managers, to educate them on you know, what the messaging was. Um, and we asked them to approach people, and if people would speak to them, we asked them to try and fill out this questionnaire. And with this, the idea isn't that we're gonna change our cleanup by any means, we're still gonna go along as we are, but um, to get a better idea of can we target specific locations where people are fishing, 
Can we get a better understanding of maybe the ethnic background of the people that are fishing more often than not? Um, whether or not, one of the big questions is, do you have concerns about the potential health effects of eating the seafood? Um, and, and a lot of the times they've given feedback that people didn't know what was going on in the harbor, or yes, they know, but they don't have any concerns. So um, these are just some of the questions that were on there. How many times a week, month, year do you consume fish? Do you freeze it? Do you need to eat around? Just to get an idea of whether or not there's a year-round exposure or if it's more annual and summertime months when people are fishing. So um, we updated it a little bit in between the years and I'm going to collect all the data from this year and maybe make a few tweaks to it again. Um, I would say that if anybody has suggestions or other things that they're interested in, you know, we met with a shellfish warning a couple of times um, going into this and afterwards to talk about where people are fishing. And actually, the first year I, I didn't have shellfish on the fact sheet or on the questionnaire, so we added that this year. Um, so I just put together a little bit of the data that I, the outreach coordinators got from the summer 2015. Um, they recorded 70 visits, 15 locations. 57% of those were inside the hurricane barrier, which is a concern to us because obviously that's the one area where we say no fishing or shell fishing is allowed. Um, we do encourage, you know, folks want to catch a release, that's fine, but certainly shouldn't be consuming fish from in there. 43% of the visits were outside the hurricane barrier in area two. Um, area three is further out, and, and they didn't go that far out, mostly because the um, average coordinators we hired were either on bike or on foot for the most part. Um, they observed 230 people fishing, spoke with 178 people and distributed 243 fact sheets, and that was in about a two and a half month span. So certainly much more than I could say that I've spoken to were fact sheets I've distributed. Um, and on top of that, they've also gone to some events, um, sports games, worked with their local churches or congregations to try and uh, educate a, a different population as well. So I find it encouraging and we're hoping that we continue to get good feedback. This is the other piece of the questionnaires. Um, I'll just read it for you. So when asked, are people not just simply out to catch and release or are they consuming food from the harbor? 85% reported yes, only 15% said no, they weren't consuming the fish they caught. Again, that's obviously um, concerning. So then we have the other questions which are, okay, you're catching the fish and you're consuming it, how often are you doing that? 35% um, of the people who reported yes so that they are consuming the fish said that they in fact do freeze it and eat it year round, which could mean that it's you know in their home and being shared with their families. Um, that was also one of the questions I didn't pull out, but are you consuming the food? Are you bringing it home and sharing it with your families? And um, you know, that was, the, significant number of folks said yes, that I'm not the only one eating the fish that I'm catching. This is just a list of, these are the types of fish, we tried to give them an idea of what um, what types of fish were which and collected, but any other quick question? Yeah, I did some outreach on this. When they freeze the fish, right, they're not using a, a separate refrigeration. They're putting it with their meats and everything else. Mm -hmm. So when they thaw out a little bit, it goes, runs right into their meat, it cross-contaminates. I did a little, a little outreach myself. I went to some of the other churches, and I went with the CD, CD, DC yes. on the Christian Avenue, right. and I went with uh, some, of the, some of the people, because I was going to sign up for that job, and I said, nah. But I went with them. Yeah. A lot of the times, when you have somebody holding up a paper in front of you and they're dictating, yeah. They clam up. Yeah. You take them to the side, you talk to them privately. There's more people than, 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 than you think that's on there. Yeah, no, I, and thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Um, There's a lot of cross contamination because it's not separate, it's, it's not frozen in a separate freezer. And that's something I, I hadn't thought about, frankly. So maybe we can talk, and, and I would welcome if other people have feedback on the questions that I should be sharing with them. I mean, not I, but the, you should have them asking. You can certainly do that. Um, I'm going to try and do a debrief with Corinne and the coordinators in the next, you know, before the end of the year. So if you'd like to join that and help us out, that'd be no, cool. I'm, I'm, no. I'm, I'm winding, <laughs> or I can give you a call. I'm winding down. I'm, right. I'm moving to the end. 
Well, thank you for the feedback. And good luck. What? <laughs> <laughs> It's a really good idea to get both of to do that and reach out that way. Um, I wonder if we might be able to do a public service announcement type of thing where you might work with the local. I know in high school they have kids that are doing, as part of their education, they do public service announcements and projects and maybe something like that. And you sometimes you can record one in one community and be shared with other communities and come out there. So that's another thing that I um, would like to get more into also is the schools and I, that's a great program maybe we can talk offline about how to do that um, and the other piece I'll mention too is that we are putting together a video about this and the risks around seafood consumption and I've spoken with um, the city about it from cable access is offered to air it on their um, their role, and also with um, about potentially getting it on a cable show in New Bedford, and certainly we could do that in Fairhaven as well. I'm just gonna let Mr. Cox ask a question. I mean, I drive around the Fayetteville waterfront every day. If you get me some of the flies, I come across fishermen all the time. I think me and you spoke about I've reported some commercial guys fishing inside the um, Hurricane Barrier. I mean, I'll, I'll be glad to, I'll keep the flies in my truck and um, be glad to pass them out to wherever I see. My boss is sitting right over there, so I'm sure he won't be uh, objective of me, uh, me doing that. I, I don't have an issue. Yeah, I and mean, if you can get me some. Uh, yeah, we would. Thank you. Yeah. They'll certainly do that. Appreciate it. Kelsey, all the group of people that's out uh, trying to educate people regarding what's going on and not eat the fish, without a pad of paper and a clipboard in their hands, it would be important to ask them, not only are they eating the fish, are they selling it to either a restaurant or a supermarket or a small market? If they don't feel like saying where, they don't have to. But you need to find out how much of the fish from the harbor is going into local restaurants as well as going into markets. There's, there's a restaurant, popular, I'm not gonna say the name, that was receiving uh, the fish from the harbor on a regular basis for a long time. So we don't wanna hear anything about that because we're already dealing with the PCBs in the environment. We don't need to hear about people eating fish from the harbor and tending with PCBs. Yeah, thank you for that. And that's, um, you know, hearing you both speak about that, I, I think encouraging them to maybe ask some questions, some, some blunt questions that we know folks won't be comfortable answering with a pen and paper in their hand. Um, that'll be part of what we talk to them about next time. I know that the health department has a, a strong effort behind trying to enforce those regulations and the fact that people should not be selling fish in the markets. I know that it's probably very overwhelming and uh, they've probably missed some here and there because it's difficult to track that down. So I certainly will, I think that's a great suggestion. I can ask them to try and note that too. I don't know how many people will admit to that, but um, but you're right, if they're not taking it down, and you know, I, d I did encourage them, uh, or not encourage them, we made it uh, very clear that they should not affiliate themselves with anybody. They should affiliate themselves with the CDC and tell them anybody they're speaking with, who they are, where they're from. Um, they did not necessarily associate themselves with EPA. We tried to make it as, as as friendly as possible because I know it's a sensitive issue that a lot of people aren't willing to talk about. Um, I have a couple other slides. So this is just again a little bit more data. Um, this is all on our, our website too if anybody's interested in going back to this. I'll make sure the slides get up online as well. This is just how often people are, are consuming the fish or reporting that they did. 18 once a week, 21, two or three times a week. Those are numbers that are concerning to us, especially because of what our risk assessment is based on and knowing um, you know, the exposure rates that could lead to long-term health effects. Okay. So uh, this is just, I wanted to show you at the end here, the maps of where we do have our signage up. There, of course, say this every time I talk to anybody here, 
if you see them down, let us know. Our contractors go out annually and um, do an inventory on them, replace any ones that are broken or torn down, um, which happens often, as most of you know. I just, I'm, I'm the mic, but I mean, okay. um, Union Wharf, I, we have, I have a, almost every day there's people fishing out there and um, we don't have any signage on Union Wharf. Where's yeah, Union Wharf is the bottom of Union Street. Um, it's the only okay. Town. Okay. It's the only town period no, that the town owns. Um, and then you could you could put them up at, at Peace Park Boatman too. I don't have any there either. Okay. A lot of guys are leaving there all the time, so um, okay. to go fishing. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Union Wharf in uh, Peace Park program. So, you know, we have put up more in recent years um, at requests like that. So, if it is, we still do have to get access to put them up there, but typically, if it's a town or city owned property, it's really easy to do that in the city. It's been, been great to do that. We have, we have a kiosk up at Fort Phoenix, and we have another sign. We've got two of them up here um those probably come down more often than others maybe but yeah yeah we try we try and keep an eye on them it's, un it's unfortunate but they do they do, do come down fairly quickly sometimes make that a pokemon so <laughs> <laughs> you can only educate people through pokemon yeah. Yeah. yeah social media is a is a good tool but uh, games are better well, yeah, I'm sure a lot of residents in Fair Haven would appreciate it if on your sign you, you had the no I'm, I'm okay, playing. You're good. Okay. The no fishing sign, international no, and then Pokemon underneath would be international no. No Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> Don't play Pokemon here or yeah, that's right. yeah. So does anybody have any questions for any of us? That was uh, uh, what we had together for the presentation for everybody. Um, I just, I know earlier you said that you would provide the, some information about the 24 samples on that and yes. a reading for each one. How would that get made? Sure. Um, so what I can do is if everybody did, I, there's a couple of sign-in sheets. And if you haven't signed in and could add your name or email address to this if you want future information, that'd be great. What I can do is as a follow-up to this meeting, um, I will send that information out along with the link to the meeting information so all the powerpoints will be up there as well to get that to everybody Kelsey if you could please explain in more detail for everyone here and the people watching cable showing on a map what is considered the trigger levels of a certain amount of PCBs for example residential area no more than one pot per million a little bit in the recreational area, no more than 25 pot per million, and so forth and so on. Sure. Um, Mike, turn the lights on for that one. Sure. Sure. So I'll turn the lights on and I'll turn that off for a second. So, um, can everybody see this map at least enough to see the waterway there? No. Hopefully. So the um, so the, the cleanup levels and exposure risks are, are based on um, amounts of exposure and through over a lifetime. So there are health risk assessment. Please, there is a risk assessment based on human health exposure, um, and the, the fish consumption risk is actually based on a, a, a very different risk assessment. I can speak to that a little bit too. Essentially, in the in the middle of the harbor in the channel where people are not coming into contact with the settlement. The cleanup level is 50 parts per million. As Dave mentioned, in we're seeing, harbor. I'm sorry, in the lower harbor. Is which it 195 is, which is or 195, right? Oh, I'm sorry, Cogshall. Cogshall. Cogshall Street, down through the Harking Barrier, the cleanup level is 50 parts per million. In the inner tidal areas, we look at that as a recreational use. That's 25 parts per million. Uh, recreational use is based on some limited exposure over a lifetime where residential properties which would be homes um, and we did address them already in the upper harbor in the early years of the cleanup those levels are one part per million PCBs that's based on a lifetime exposure of living in a home every day for 30 years or 
I believe it's 30 years or more lifetime exposure rate. A high number of exposures per year. A high number of exposures per year. And to be clear as well, that doesn't just mean PCBs, if you touch PCBs, that doesn't mean you're going to see an effect on your skin. It actually physically has to get into your into your body, and which is why our most sensitive population that we look at whenever we do a human health risk assessment is women of childbearing age, pregnant women, and children. Children are obviously more likely to get play in the dirt, get things in their hands, eat things, um, and obviously a, a pregnant woman is also an added concern um, due to a fetus. So those are where we get those those three levels of cleanup. Um, the seafood consumption risk is based on, and I, I should clarify, I'm not a not a health expert, um, but it is based on uh, again an exposure rate of, depending on the fish, um, an annual I mean, eating of fish a certain number of times a week, a month, a year, over a lifetime, and our cleanup, um, our our number of. I want to be clear on this. So there's a, there's a federal number, a federal, an FDA number for PCBs and fish, which is much higher than um, the number that EPA finds accept, acceptable in the harbor, because we're assuming that people that are fishing in New Bedford Harbor are using the fish from New Bedford Harbor as their main source of seafood, meaning that they're not getting their fish from a variety of different places, especially like I just showed you if they're fishing in the harbor. So it's a very conservative um, number. We're trying to be overly protective and sensitive of the fact that those people may only be eating fish from the harbor. Did that explain it? Kelsey, the unfortunate truth, too, is, uh, of course, they're having a cushion residential right at Budding, they even have a little bit of How does the EPA feel about people having backyard vegetable gardens in areas where they probably do have one pot per million of PCBs or higher, and even raised beds because of maybe air quality with PCBs. How does the EPA feel should these residents have a vegetable garden along the hub? So again, I'm not a, a health expert. The, the EPA the bottom line truth is that if they're having vegetables growing in their yard along the river, we know we're looking, as I said, at intertidal levels. So hopefully we'll know what's there. We also know that if there's a lot of other things in an urban area and soils. Um, I would recommend that if you're going to have a, a garden in your backyard, a vegetable garden, you should have your soil tested anyway. I say that to anybody I speak with. Um, there's a lot of different things. Lead, for instance, is really prevalent in urban areas. That's something you probably don't want to have in your vegetable garden. If you have a raised bed, um, it should be soil that's brought in, and most of that should be tested ahead of time. Um, we're here to clean up the PCB, so I don't want to make comments based on the other contaminants that could be there, but. Yeah, I mean, I think what the risk assessment shows <coughs> is that, the, again, the uh, unacceptable risk at this site is due to fish consumption and dermal contact that is actually physically touching the soil. Secondary exposure, like uh, uptake into a plant, is much more more uh, uh, Also, called subsolubility of the material into the plant roots. PCBs are not very soluble in water, so it's pretty doubtful that that would be an exposure. But it's someone grow enough to get enough exposure for that to be an issue in the first place. Another very important area that the EPA needs to pay attention to because there are a lot of children, a lot of people walking their animals, and uh, a lot of play activity that goes on on a regular basis right near the harbor. And that's Cook Park, which is at the foot of Pilgrim Avenue, where the two monuments are. Okay? And uh, there's also a Japanese festival that occurs around May. You know, again, a lot of children playing, rolling around on the ground. So I'm wondering if uh, you may want to work with the town to get permission to test that soil at Cook Park to see if there are any concerns because it's right there, right yards away from the cat cell site and right, right near the harbor. So again, that's an area where I don't know if we've sampled in the inner title. Right? I would have to. I would get. I would have to go back. To that. I don't have those. We can. I can look and see if we've sampled on that property. I would say, 
again, the, the sediment is why we're there under Superfund. That's what we're regulated to, to address under our remedy. Um, you know, it would be up to the town, if it's town owned property, to take a sample there. We can't, it's out of our scope of work to go and start sampling soil on properties that are not related to the harbor site. Yes. I, I, <clears throat> I'll go out and live here. I believe we did sample there. I don't believe there was an issue there. But I don't have the documents here. So. Any other title? Yes. And so up to the meeting, send you the results then? Yeah. 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 I believe it is town property, and I believe we did sample there. Uh, but I forget the figures. I don't have those. We can follow up on that. But again, that would be up to the meeting high time. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'll get all this information out of the slides. If anybody's got questions, we'll be here for a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you.